Well, hello and welcome to another lesson from God's Word. I'm glad that, glad that you could join me today. And if you would take your Bibles and find the Old Testament book of Nahum. Nahum. It's one of the minor prophets. You find the book of Jonah, keep going. Got Jonah, Micah, Nahum, and Habakkuk, he's in that area there. Nahum chapter 1. And we're going to start reading in verse 1. I'm reading from the NIV today. An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea, and it dries up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence. The world and all who are or who, who live in it? Who can withstand his indignation? And who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into darkness. You get down to verse 14. It says, the Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the carved images and cast idols that are in the temple of your gods, and I will prepare your grave, for you are vile. Nahum, he's one of the 12 minor prophets, and he has a very serious message for Nineveh. It's a message of judgment. And as you can tell from the reading, for the most part, you find lots of doom and gloom in this little book. Sprinkled here and there, you'll find some brief rays of hope. Like uh, verse 7, it says, The Lord is good and a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. And so even in the midst of a book of, of judgment, God wants us to know that he loves us and he will comfort and care for those who trust in him. In fact, Nahum's very name means comfort or consolation, but you'll find very little comforting verses or consoling thoughts in the book of Nahum. It's pretty much a book of judgment against Nineveh, the city of Nineveh and the nation of Assyria. In chapter 2 and verse 13, Nahum quotes God as saying, I am against you. And you'll find the same thing in chapter 3. God says, I am against you. And what a terrible thought it is to think of God being against us. And so Nahum wants to make it very clear what happens to people who reject God. And that's really the overall message of the book. Nineveh was the capital city of the world power Assyria. And it was a, a fantastic city, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, built great walls around the city, complete with 15 massive gates. He created public parks and gardens and aqueducts and irrigation canals all over the city. His palace had 80 rooms, and he proclaimed it the palace without rival. I mean, Nineveh was truly a sight to behold in the ancient world. Uh, remember the city was so large that it took Jonah three days to, to walk across it. And so Nahum was one of two prophets whom God sent to preach against Nineveh. The first prophet, I've already mentioned his name, of course, was Jonah. Jonah was sent to preach against Nineveh. In Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we read, And the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. That was about a hundred years before Nahum's time. And as you recall, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. 
Jonah hated the Assyrians. and he, he didn't want to go preach to the people of that city. He wanted God to destroy that city. And so uh, he so didn't want to go, he got on a boat going the other way. And of course, there was a storm that God sent. And then he was cast overboard and swallowed by a great fish. Finally, he got the point, hey, I need to obey God. And so he does. And he goes to Nineveh and he preaches against the people there. And the people listen. They believe Jonah's preaching. And so they, they repent and God has mercy on them. And he spares them from the judgment that he had planned. Again, Nahum says in our text, in chapter 1 and verse 3 of his book, he says, God is slow to anger. And we see an example of that very thing in the book of Jonah. But again now, that was a hundred years in the past. That'd be like comparing modern day America to what this country was like back in, what, 1922. It was a hundred years ago. So Jonah's preaching got the people of Nineveh to repent back then. But that was a generation ago. And all those folks have long since died away. And so now we find in the book of Nahum that Nineveh is back to its evil ways. And God has seen enough. And so now it's Nahum's turn to preach to the people of Nineveh. And through Nahum, his prophet, God makes it plain that he's angry at Nineveh. And, you know, we don't like to think about God being angry. And yet the Bible is clear. See, Jonah's message is what happens to people who turn back to God. But Nahum's message is what happens to people who turn away from God. You've probably seen those billboards on the highway with messages from God. Have you seen those? One says, uh, it's Ten Commandments, not Ten Suggestions, God. Another one says, don't make me come down there. And, you know, I, I, I guess they're meant to be humorous. But, you know, there's nothing amusing about God's anger, is it? Hebrews 10 and verse 31 says, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And Hebrews 12, 29 reminds us that our God is a consuming fire. There's nothing amusing about God being against us or God being angry with us. The Hebrew word used by Nahum for anger literally means heavy or hot breathing. I mean, think about a, a big angry bull and he's charging towards you at, at, at full speed. And he's so close that you can feel his hot breath breathing on the back of your neck. Can you, can you imagine God becoming so angry with us that it would be like a raging bull at full charge, breathing down your neck? I mean, it's a frightening thought, isn't it? But the fact of the matter is, even though God gets very angry at our sin, he is very patient with us. Again, Nahum 1.3 says the Lord is slow to anger. He, he has control over his wrath. And he gives us chance after chance after chance to repent and turn to him. He sent his only begotten son to die on that cross for our sins so we could be saved from hell. But folks, listen to me. God clearly warns humanity in Genesis 6 and verse 3. He says, my spirit will not strive with man forever. In other words, God is warning us, listen, there is a limit to my patience. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 says, the Lord is long-suffering with us. That means he's patient with us and is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the very next verse says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And so at some point, God's patience will end and his judgment will begin. Again, that verse, 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord is patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, that's what God wants. He's patiently waiting for sinners to turn away from their wicked ways and turn to him for salvation. That's what he wants. But folks, even God doesn't get everything he wants. Have you ever thought about that? 
Even God doesn't get everything he wants because God wants every person to repent. That's what the verse says. God wants every person to be saved. But God's word clearly tells us that that's not going to happen. That there's a wide gate and a broad path leading to destruction and there are many going that way. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. Those are the words of Jesus in Matthew 7 verses 13 and 14. And listen, the way to life isn't difficult because, because God made it hard for us to obey it. No, it's difficult because sin is so much fun. Let's face it, if sin didn't feel good, if sin wasn't fun, then nobody would be sinning. That's what's attractive about it. And, and so it feels so good, at least in the short term, that people just go right on sinning. And they never give God a second thought. They never even think about it until God's patience runs out and his judgment falls. And then, like the Nineveh that Nahum preached to, it's much too late. So many people today, folks, are spiritually blind. Do you hear me? They're blind to the things of God. They either don't believe that God will punish sin or they don't believe in God in the first place. People convince themselves that they don't deserve any negative consequences for the evil that they've done. Either that or they convince themselves that evil is not really evil. I find that that's happening more and more today. Evil is not really evil. And people act like it's not right, it's not fair that they should have to face any consequences for their actions. We live in a culture that thinks that right and wrong is a matter of opinion. That there's no absolutes, there's no absolute truth. We, we live in a nation full of people and leaders who think that they can make up their own rules or that the rules don't apply to them. That there's no such thing as right or wrong. It's just a matter of how you look at it. It's just a matter of how you spin the narrative. And folks, let me tell you, that's a scary place for a nation to be. But that's where we are now. There was a Russian author whose name, I, I, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce his name. But he said something very profound. He said, if there is no God, anything is permissible. Now, folks, let those words sink in because that's where we are as a country. We're at a point where literally anything goes. Anything but Christianity, that is. Because more and more, that's the one thing that people will not tolerate, Christianity. We've turned away from God as a nation. And more and more, we're rejecting all authority and all accountability. And so what's God's response to all this rebellion? All this lawlessness, he removes his grace, he removes his, his mercy, and he gives us what we deserve, judgment. That's what he did with Nineveh, and that's what he will do with any people that turn away from him. A just God will condemn and judge sin. Nahum tells us in chapter 3 and verse 5 of his book, I am against you, declares the Lord God Almighty. What a frightening position to be in, to have the Almighty God say, I am against you. Folks, in so many ways, America has become like Nineveh. In so many ways, our nation has turned its back on God. We continue to mercilessly kill innocent unborn children and claim that it is our right to do so. We've thrown out God's definition of marriage and we've embraced perversion, even though Romans 1 says that to do so is to exchange the truth of God for a lie. But that's what so many people have done today. They've thrown the truth of God out and they have embraced a lie. Even though the Bible says that God created us male and female, we've raised up a generation who've been taught the lie that they can change their gender if they want to. And they can pick any one of 80-something genders. People in very powerful positions are trying to erase any mention of God from our culture, outlawing public prayer and public Bible reading. 
And, and of course, they, I could just keep going with these examples. But for all of this and more, we have angered the living God. And I pray, I sincerely pray that we will be like the Nineveh that Jonah preached to and we will repent and not be like the Nineveh that Nahum preached to and be judged and destroyed. And so which Nineveh will we be? The Nineveh that Nahum knew was overthrown so completely that archaeologists only uncovered the remains of it in 1845. The city was flooded, just like God prophesied in Nahum 1 and verse 8, and then it was burned. And so complete was its destruction that we've been told that armies have actually marched over the city of Nineveh without even knowing it. It's just a pile of rubble now out in the Iraqi desert near the city of Mosul. And so here is the warning for America. No nation is immune from judgment when that nation turns away from God. Judgment came for Assyria. Judgment came for Babylon. Judgment came for Jerusalem. Judgment came for Rome. And mark my words, judgment can come for us too. Proverbs 14 and verse 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach and disgrace to any people. Proverbs 29 and verse 1 warns, Some people are still stubborn after they have been corrected many times. They will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. Twice God said to Nineveh, I am against you. And will he say the same thing to us? Now, I happen to believe that there is still hope for our country. I do. I believe that there's still a whole lot of people in this country that call on God and believe in God's Son. I believe there's hope. And I don't believe that we have to end up being judged by an angry God like Assyria and so many other nations. Because God is patient. And God is loving. And God is forgiving. And so far, He's held back His judgment against us. But for how long? I have no way of knowing. And neither do you. Right now, as a nation and, and, and as a people, we stand at a crossroads. And so we can either be like the Nineveh that Jonah preached to and we can repent. Or we can be like the Nineveh that Nahum preached to and fall and be judged. And so, in conclusion, what can we do about it? Right? What, what can faithful people of God do at a time like this? Well, I'll tell you, here's some things we can do. Number one, we can pray. And I hope that you are already praying. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, I urge then, first of all, that requests and prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Listen, for kings and for those who are in authority. Are you praying for the leaders of this country? And then from 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, come those words, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. What can we do? We can pray. Something else we can do is we can teach our own children. You might not have enough influence to sway the hearts of every American, but I tell you what you can do. You can be a godly parent in your home, and you can have a godly impact of those who are in your home. And so, folks, let's teach our children. Let's teach our children to love and respect the Lord and let them grow up hearing prayers in the home and let them grow up hearing the Bible read in the home. Deuteronomy 11, verses 8. 18 and 19 says, fix these words of mine, God says, in your hearts and then teach them to your children. And then Ephesians 6, 4 says, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. What can we do? We can pray. We can teach our children and something else. We can continue to speak Jesus. We can keep speaking Jesus every day. Shine his light in all the dark places in your world among the people that you know and you come in contact with. 
Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says, You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men. And Romans 1, 16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God and the salvation. And Mark 16, 15 and 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. And so let our neighbors and friends hear of the Jesus who saves. Don't worry whether or not the world, you know, laughs at you or labels you as some kind of fanatic. Because our first century brethren faced a lot worse than that, folks. And yet they spread the gospel of Jesus all over the world. And then finally, what can we do? We can vote. We can exercise our right to vote in this next election that's just coming up in a couple of days. We can elect leaders who respect the Lord and respect his word and who will follow the rule of law. And so, folks, let's not kid ourselves. By our sin and rebellion against God, we are standing as a nation on dangerous ground. Let's be vigilant. Let's be unshakable in our faith as we pray for America and cry out against the sins of this nation. You know, Paul says in Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? But God told Nineveh, I am against you. And so let's faithfully work and pray that God will be for us and never against us. Would you bow with me for a prayer? Our dearest Father in heaven, we come to you now and we, Father, admit that as a nation and as a people, we have turned away from you. And Father, we have seen other nations rise and fall. And so, Father, for those of us who still call on your name and believe in you and believe in your Son, we lift our voices together that the heart of this nation can be turned back to you and that we can survive as a people. I pray, Father, that you'll bless this nation, that you'll continue to be patient as more and more people come to believe in you and believe in the Son that you sent. Father, we love you, and we give you all the glory and praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.